And thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Christabel Darcy. I'm co-convener of the Northern Territory branch of the Australian Evaluation Society, along with Alison Reedy, who is also here today. Do a wave, Alison. Oh. <laughs> As we get settled in, um, please introduce yourself in the chat. Include your name and the Indigenous country that you're calling from. I know for some people, this is your first Australian Evaluation Society event, so welcome. Uh, and it's great to see some old friends and colleagues here too. All right, so let's see if we can start the, the chat. I'll get us started. Lovely, starting to see them come through now. Thank you. Great. Lots of people from Larrakia country. That's good to see. Ah, oh, now we're getting from other parts of Australia. Fantastic. Nunga, lovely. Welcome. It's uh, really good. We've got people from all over Australia today. So thank you. Uh, it's really good to get a feel for who is here today. So in terms of housekeeping, I'd like to let you know that this session is being recorded today. Uh, so can I please ask that you keep your video off or microphone off unless you're a host or presenter. Uh, and as we go along, please put any questions that you have in the chat uh, and I'll facilitate questions at the end. So I'd like to start today by acknowledging that I'm hosting this call from Larrakia country. Uh, I acknowledge the Larrakia people as the traditional owners of the Darwin region and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging of the many countries that people are calling from today. And I particularly want to acknowledge the people of vintage country for sharing their story today. And today we're talking about the benefits and the challenges associated with community-based evaluations. Uh, and we're joined by John Gunther and Robin Ober. And if technology allows, we'll be joined by some community researchers, Dean and Conrad too. So John Gunther is an evaluator uh, and researcher with 20 years experience working in the Northern Territory. He's a non-Indigenous outsider in most of the evaluations that he works on. And he's currently the research leader for education and training with Bachelor Institute. Robin Ober is a Marmal Jirabal woman from North, uh, far North Queensland. And she has worked extensively in Indigenous education for over 30 years and currently works as an Indigenous Research Fellow at Bachelor Institute. Robin has been and is currently involved in a number of projects on Indigenous education, leadership, language and linguistics, including evaluation reviews. And with that, I'll hand over to John and Robin. Thank you. Robin, if you want to take it over for a couple of slides, that'd be great, thanks. Yes, yeah, sure. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for that introduction. Um, uh, Chris, Christabel, we are, um, like we said, we are on Larrakia country doing this presentation. So again, I give my uh, thanks and my respect, as is our cultural protocol, um, that we are meeting on Larrakia country, and I pay my respects to our elders, past, present, and emerging. I also um, recognise and acknowledge um, any of our Indigenous researchers, scholars, academics who are joining us today, as well as our non-Indigenous um, colleagues, and um, pay my respects to your um, countries and nations that you represent today. And I want to give special acknowledgement to our Binning people who are from Western Arnhem Land and from, um, you know, these are the people we've worked with. Um, and I give uh, my respect and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, this is a map of just the communities that we've worked in over the past few years. And this is what we will be focusing on today. And we'll be hearing more from Conrad and Dean about, our, about the evaluation review of Nawarikan. Um, but I'll just ask John to show on the map, Gabalwanamu. Um, uh, Manmoy and Mamarawiri, 
So these are the three homeland centers that we've worked closely with in the past three to four years on this review and um, work closely with our binning researchers, our community researchers. Without them, this would not have happened. Our community researchers have been so valuable and their knowledge base extensive and deep. Um, so uh, like John said at the beginning, we were really the facilitators um, and they really took the lead and control of this um, with us supporting uh, throughout. So. We've also got an ABC News story link there that we will um, pass on to the team for you to look at in your own time. Uh, we won't look at it now because of, of co time constraints, but um, it is really um, something special to look at. And that'll give you like grassroots stories from local binning people about education. Thanks, John. So, um... Back in 2018, I think it was, um, I was asked by somebody to have a cup of coffee um, here at CDU and to talk about the possibilities of uh, doing some evaluative work with Nawadakan Academy. Uh, at the time, Nawadakan Academy was a, a, a fairly new uh, independent school that had an MOU working with uh, Gumbalanya School just starting out really on a, on a long journey. And they decided that they wanted to build evaluation into the development of their uh, school. Um, and so uh, Robert and I uh, went on a journey with uh, the, uh, the school and in particular, our community research team. You can see Dean there in the photo and you can see Tara as well, uh, who, who was working with us um, to learn from and do, do, to, to help the academy learn from and develop its governance academic and community engagement processes and to determine what the outcomes and values of its work are that was really what we were setting out to do we and we set this up as a like, largely qualitative and participatory action research process that ended up running over three years uh, and just one step at a time doing that planning reflecting uh, then, then implementing some things and then uh, gathering some data and then going back to the cycle over, over that period of time, uh, drawing on Indigenous standpoints, uh, particularly from the community researcher side of things. And wherever possible, we were working in uh, language, in Gunwinku language. Uh, the report itself is a, is a nice looking document and you can download that on the link when you get the uh, when you get the, the PowerPoint to have a look at um, with some great pictures in it, but also some really useful information about what we did as uh, in, in the evaluation of Nawadigan Academy and how we worked with community based researchers uh, to to make that happen or how. Yeah, you know, yeah. You know, they were the ones that were leading the process, basically, and we were there sort of uh, working in the background to make some other things happen. So. I want to give, uh, I'll start with Dean, give, give him an opportunity to, to share from uh, your perspective, Dean, um, some of the, the the things that you learnt during this process of uh, going through uh, an evaluation um, and what, what it meant to you. You've been involved with community research for years and years and years, I know, uh, going back to the ARPNET days, but um, uh, I'm, I'm thinking here about this particular uh, piece of work that we did. Um, what are your thoughts and reflections on it, Dean? Thank you, uh, John. Look, I've, I have a, I have been um, involved with a research network um, for many years. My first research network was a com Commonwealth uh, program, part of the community engagement program that regards to, you know, um, education process uh, of indigenous people. These practices of our community research has brought us, and um, brought me into something that I never thought about it before, about community researchers. But time to time, uh, I've gone through um, through this process, and I first set it up with a uh, 
uh, groups within uh, Charles Darwin University. It would we are called uh, Aboriginal um, Practitioners Network. Because the research um, looking at the um, education pro process, my mind um, started to look into where we had external researchers coming in and collecting information about education, and not only just education, but other things as well. But this process um, uh, with our education, when we first started to think about setting up our own independent school uh, within these uh, remote areas, especially the three new schools that now who made it happen. We, our involvement is to teach young ones and let the elder people know what it's meant about the research. We delivered research in our own language. We told our elders that this is a research is we are developing that we are collecting our information, indigenous instrument, how do we see a education process has been gone for the last decades. A lot of the information that uh, we gather, it's a voice of the people. What do they want? How they want to see? How they want to be involved? What area that need to be seen is it important where the education is in place? They talked, we talked about indigenous education. What is indigenous education? And we're trying to compare with Western education. Our indigenous education that need to be brought it out to the mainstream. What we're doing now is gathering external information the way it should be done. But a lot of the um, information that we gather, it's a people's voice, people's opportunity that they want to see that education process in in a place, not only just in a growth areas, such as Meningrida, such as Kunbalanya, or such as Kumilda College or universities where our children, uh, you know, uh, being uh, participated and studying and learning. By, by our researchers being taught is to deliver this education information to our people and get their voices, what do they want? People really, really appreciated how we collect information. People really said, this is a story that our stories need to be shown in, my, in many areas, especially our education department, also especially our community uh, education programs. It's about the fact that they were getting this information. It's it's a people want to see how this research needs to be taken place. Because when we're talking to our own people, we get so much feedback from our people because this is it's an opportunity because a lot of the time external researchers would come in and take a note. And a lot of the time, uh, people don't tell them about what really they want because they're seeing the research is coming from elsewhere rather than seeing the research is from in our own land, such as our own people, indigenous people doing this research network. And they can give us a lot of information that they needed 
one of the three main schools that we wanted to see that education happen in a homeland was back in the 80s. All this in homeland education was pulled down to the main uh, growth areas. Even though there were some small, uh, small communities, that education process was still carrying on, even though that they, you know, um, uh, had the system has changed uh, from community uh, homeland um, community schools, where where previously, not long ago, people was receiving education on two days a week. And that's not enough. People wanted a five, seven days, five days a week educations. And that's what driven our people within the plateau, the three main school, people who are really, really want to see that five days education need to be taken place rather than two days education. People, the teachers would fly in into homeland. Normally they used to teach two days and they would go back and leaving homeland without our teachers. Actually, they had a uh, teaching teaching ice that day, but they haven't been supported as well. Now that we have this uh, unique uh, three school, our communities, our children are very, very happy because this is very important because our education is based in the bush rather than based in the, in the community. Because our children get a can get a benefit seeing the views of their families are working within a land management space, or seeing their families working within the education space in in the homeland. So the child is getting those learning, learning, but from that time period when he's going through the school to able to learn um, to able to grow up, being 17, 18. They would get a proper jobs, and you know, uh, continue uh, sharing and learning with other children as well, and other adults. Every every uh, elders now they you know they came forward and talking about this education process. It took us a long, long time to you know convince our government to able to see the education space within a homeland, because it is very, very important. People still living in homeland without, without even a teachers. People now, our experience now is being extended to other communities such as Manning Greta, because they're seeing a value of how that school is, what is happening. Also being a researchers, our own people, getting collecting all the information in homelands, what do they know about the schools? A lot of the uh, eldest one, we we talk to them about education, what what were they what was their education in the past? So, you know, there, there was a great length of information. So, you know, was getting that and getting our people to explore the benefit of education within our homelands. Mm. That's fantastic, Dean. Um, it looks like Conrad's just uh, joined us. Um, uh, hey, Conrad, can you hear me? Hey, Conrad, can you hear me? Oh. Hello. Yeah. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, I, and Dean has just shared, I don't know whether you've been online or not, but uh, Dean has just shared a little bit about his experience and, and the importance of uh, uh, having community researchers in the context of homeland schooling. I'm just wondering if you would just like to share a few thoughts about your involvement um, over the years as uh, do, doing research uh, or evaluation um, and 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 how that has made a difference uh, to the places that you you work and live in, you know the you know how's it made a difference to Mamadouari and the school there? Um, Conrad, can you reflect a little bit on, on your role? <clears throat> um, firstly, 
year when we started, I mean, when Cabo Warner Mill started, start the um, independent school in Cabo Warner Mill, it was pretty small. And then us at Marmore and Manmoy had no one to do with schools. And at that time, it was compliance held at involvement with our station schools. And then <clears throat> we wanted five days. They, they they tried their best to give us five days, but they only gave us two days. And then my, my experience when we turned that thing over, having independent with Kabuanamyo and having two other schools, Manmoy and Mamre, it pretty much changed. Everything changed. The whole school education change. We've got we've got facilities. We've got teachers. You know, teachers staying there at at homeland where they continue teaching during Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday and Friday. And sometimes teachers get involved with you know weekends, at fishing, hunting. You know, and then us more we see that it's still like education because. We, all of us, all Benin people, we were educated through bush hunting, fishing, and you know animals and seasons, and you know that's the the role we we were willing to you know commit with our kids, and right, that basically giving us fifty fifty on our terms of education, and it's doing very well now. And we've got kids now traveling other communities, other countries, and in, in a process of learning different culture. And with with this experience, kids really enjoying. And us, us adults, you know, we, we see that very positive things coming in for our kids' education. As Dean was explaining how he see and how I see it and, and you know, our valuations keeps that very close to us more in our homelands because that value in our communities where our kids, you know, value themselves, who they are and what, what their representation to their homelands. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Conrad. Um, Olga, I see you're just sort of, uh, you popped your, your face on the, on the, uh, on the screen now. I just want to, Ask you just briefly, as uh, uh, effectively the, the the principal of the of the three schools, uh, reflect a little bit on the evaluation and then and the and the impact that it's had on the school. Yeah, thanks, thanks, John, and um, look, Dean and Conrad, very well, very well spoken. And there was one word that kind of stood out for me that both Dean and Conrad um, used quite extensively, and that's value. You know where do we place value on what education looks like? Um, and I think the the greatest thing about the evaluation is, is not only did it give us a guide in terms of our strategic planning, but also, you know, we, we were able to get a clear understanding of what community parents and students value in terms of what their education looks like. And I mean, look, um, Conrad and Dean have already spoken, you know, quite extensively about that. But what that's meant is that with our planning, we can hand on heart say that, you know, we've got this amazing document, this evaluation document now that, you know, is guiding us and we're going to use that over the next few years um, to be able to, to make sure that, you know, that that value is where it's supposed to be. Um, so that involved... I guess, redefining kind of what success looks like. A lot of the time, education success is very much, or what it looks like is driven from, from non-Indigenous cultures and, you know, accessing university courses and perhaps there's a, sometimes there's, a you know, a mismatch or not, not a strong link between what success on community and what Indigenous people value of success looks like and what, um, what's on the ground. And the biggest thing about value we've found is, you know, there's there's also a really big push 
to make sure that, you know, there's high attendance rates, you know, and there's always this talk about attendance and what value has done, you know, putting the value in the right places and putting resources into where people's values lies means that we get engagement and with engagement, you get, you get attendance, you get families and communities and students who want to be in that space because what's in that space is valuable and engaging to them. That's a, that's a, a, a great point, uh, Olga. Thank you. And uh, often, often evaluations uh, are focused on outcomes. Um, and as, as you said, there are things like attendance and uh, grades and whatever else. But it, it very this, this evaluation very quickly morphed into a, a focus on values um, and what was important for binning people in their communities and uh, uh, and, and having uh, Dean Conrad, Terra, and a few others uh, on board as uh, as researchers, we were able to get to the heart of what values people wanted to see in their school and their education. Dean Conrad, you got any comment about that? Um, we we value um, we value this education process because we're we're seeing a two ways a uh, process. Uh, being uh, should be taught in 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 this sort of space, traditional educations and Western educations. We know uh, I know when I when I look at the community side, um, such as Manning Reader or Mount Valley, children sometimes don't have an access. Um, access of uh, you know moving out in a bush and looking at or learning of some you know traditional cultural practices. Um, we're seeing a family uh, talking to their children as well because uh, what they're seeing is what's happening within our three main schools because our children are very very happy. Children, uh, you know, uh, more, you know, are taught in both both world traditional practices and Western practices. For mm -hmm. us as the researchers, we value ourselves because we are there for them. We're getting information. We we're collecting those information and we're delivering this information and documenting. So that in the future we can follow or future for our children can see those documents have been written and for them to able to use those information, seeing that importance um, of education should be placed in uh, homeland as well. Right, thank you. I'm, I'm just going to move on a, a little bit now um, because I'm conscious of time and, and I'll, I'll bring Dean and Conrad back into the story in a moment. But I just wanted to sort of uh, think about uh, this kind of evaluative work uh, from a few different perspectives. And one is an, uh, an ethical perspective. Um, and anyone that's worked in uh, a, um, a university or a um, uh, in an institute like Bachelor knows what the word ethics means. Um, but and, and sometimes it means getting a, a an approval from an ethics committee. But in a in a broader sense, what we've been able to learn, I guess, is that 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 piece of paper that comes and says, tick, you can go out and do uh, research because you've got clearance is really not the same as working uh, ethically. And the importance, I think, of uh, using binning, uh, speaking Gunwinku language on their country to engage with community members is an ethical process in itself, um, outside of uh, or alongside of the ethical clearance process that happens uh, uh, through a committee. And it's important to work this way because uh, those of us who are outsiders, myself and even Robin in this case, uh, are uh, we don't know what the protocols are. Uh, we don't 
we don't know what the values are that people uh, uh, cherish in their in their community. We don't know uh, the the I guess the the kinship connections, and we don't know um, a, a lot about the history of the place, but our community researchers do, um, and it gives them I think as. Uh, uh, Dean and Conrad have said a space for binning to voice their opinions in a in a safe way. Um, but um, you know, for those of us who are outsiders, uh, it it takes a bit of getting used to the I guess the the uncertainty that comes along with working in these spaces. Uncertainty for us uh, as as outsiders. Sometimes you just don't know what's going to happen. You don't even know whether or not you're going to get to where you're going to, to go to collect the data. And especially during the COVID uh, period, there were times uh, where, um, you know, things were always up in the air. Uh, Robin, I don't know whether you can tell the story about the time we went out to Gubba one of you when COVID was on. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um... I think I, I, I talked um, earlier with John and that being okay with uncertainty and, you know, when we when we got ready for trips, we would do like this loose plan, I'd call it uh, planning loosely because it was pretty, you know, hard to really put down concrete things that we were going to do because you just don't know what's around the corner you don't don't know what's what's happening and so in the case of COVID I remember the pilot flying in we we kind of got little pings up in the air that something had happened in Darwin um but we kind of okay we're all, we're almost here we're ready to land at uh Gubbawanamu and we landed and um as soon as we landed we 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 had the uh, ranger, the Dalek ranger come in and the troopy and just had her hands up, parked away from us and said, stop, there's been a COVID case up in Darwin. You have to jump back on the plane and go back home. And we can't risk you coming here. John and I had just come from Darwin and I think one of the other researchers was with us on that plane. Hmm. Um, and so that was, you know, we had to go back to kind of square one and start again and think about how we're going to um, do our do our data collection. But you 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 just um, plan loosely and and um, often we get there, we plan from A to B. This is what we want to um, achieve at the end of this this visit. And we usually get there, but sometimes it's a little bit stop and start. It's, you know, down the detour, up the hill, around the corner, and then we'll get there eventually. Um, but that's the beauty of it. And I, I love, you know, working with our binning researchers. And um, I mainly work with the with the women. John would, would work um, with the men. But um, it was also just um learning as we go along and so even the 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 issue with the relationships and kinships it wasn't as straightforward as I, I used to think oh okay you know we can all just talk together but I remember a time when we had to wait for a certain uh, person to come and set up the meeting and send, set up the um the yarning um around the around the weaving circle we we we, the women were doing some weaving and and it wasn't just anybody it had to be the right person so I had to learn along the way I had to be that continual learner even though I've I've, all, I've worked out in Western Arnhem Land um, previously but it was really you know <laughs> you're continually learning and I've learned so much from our from our people out there. Fantastic. One of the beautiful things that I find uh, when we uh, are, are out, as Robin has just said, the learning that goes on, the learning that goes on for us as outsiders, but you can see the learning that goes on among the community researchers as well as they think through some of the issues uh, from their own perspective. But the, the good thing about working with with community people is that it's not just an exercise of gathering information for a report there's a whole lot of skill development and relationship building uh, that goes on and opportunities for sharing the stories uh, that that uh, 
that come out of the, the work that you do and opportunities for writing, opportunities for analysis, uh, interpretation and language work. Um, it's it's rich when you have a, a team uh, that that's made up of, uh, of people like um, uh, you know Dean and Conrad and a few of the others and Rosemary's in the in the picture there with uh, Robin. Uh, very very rich kind of work. Um, Conrad, I just wonder if you can uh, reflect on your experience. Uh, either at Wipsy or at in South Africa when you went on uh, to the conference there, you might need to unmute yourself. <laughs> or may maybe Dean, if you oh no, Conrad, you're right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, but see in Adelaide, I think, mm. and then South Africa, and then I think I went to Canada. That's right. For that, um. What the name of that Canada thing? We, we, okay. we, at, at my experience with Canada, you know, there's a whole lot of people talking about climate change and all that other stuff. And then we, we produce, you know, what we do in, in Australia, what our goals and achievements. And, and having that over there talking about how we work and how, and learning from them, you know, that's whole, whole new experience, level of ex experience learning about, you know, climate change. And then when I was in Africa, you know, a lot of countrymen out there in Africa, which is, you know, they still, you know, education, it's really hard. But at Canada, you know, education, it's more open and then, and then when, when I was in Adelaide having that Wipsy, you know, the whole indigenous programs are, you know, you know, it, it, it's showing how we can make this possible for us, some indigenous people in Northern Territory and, and in Adelaide and other countries, you know, because our, our culture, is, first to us mob the way we live in our countries and how we recognize it and then that that makes us look better if we work with you know other educational programs like having schools there learning about English and some kids do want to learn other languages like you know some some kids might might want to learn Italian or other, other languages because uh, so I heard some kids can't speak other languages. They are trying to learn um, what the language I'm not Italian. Anyway, these other languages, it's really hard for me to say it. and only kids know it. And they always, you know, give us story about what languages they talking about. I've got my nephew, he he studies Chinese sometimes, and then he's trying to learn Chinese. You know, this whole experience, we we indicating ourselves where we want to be and we you know, learn about. And that's a whole heap of other things. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Conrad. Um, I guess the, th the thing about uh, th these experiences that you've had in uh, uh, in Adelaide, Africa, Canada, and Dean, you've been to Ecuador as well. They 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 do cost, and you've got a plan to 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 do these things. They're really valuable exercises. Mm. But um, you know, if you're putting a, together a budget for an evaluation, and you want to do this stuff, you have to put it into the plan at the beginning of the process. And we were pretty fortunate with this. Uh, uh, with the evaluation that Robin and I and the team were involved with uh, for Nawadakan is that we had the opportunity to put our wish list into the budget at the beginning. And because it was funded through philanthropy, we didn't get the same pushback from uh, a, a government tender that you would, you would sometimes get if you were doing uh, this sort of more commercially. And they allowed us the freedom to be able to say, yes, we want to build in three conferences um, 
uh, one overseas one and and two Australian ones. And we did that. Um, they they allowed for us to uh, you know to make a, a a nice looking report and to create videos and all sorts of things. And it and it comes about as a result of just planning to do things in the right way the first time at the beginning. Um, and you know, I'd encourage anyone that's sort of thinking about doing an evaluation uh, in in communities is to put those things into the budget, and then push back against those that say, "Do we do we really need that?" Because we do need that in order to to get the best out of uh, out of the evaluation. It's not just a report. The evaluation is an opportunity to make a difference and to change. Uh, the, the way that we work and the change to change the structures that we work in. Uh, but there are cost and resource implications for that. Uh, the other thing I'd say too uh, is that we had incredible support from the school. And in, in particular, I just want to acknowledge Olga's uh, contribution, uh, the way that nothing was too hard for, for Olga. It was like, we're going to make this happen one way or another, you know, and, and, that sort of partnership that you've that you can have with a with a, a client uh, is is just beautiful because it's no longer just a client anymore. There's a relationship that's been built up over several years that you become partners in in a process. Um, and you, you, I guess you can't really plan for that, but it, it's uh, it's a beautiful way of being able to work when you've got that sort of strength of the relationship. I just uh, I just want to finish with this last slide here, and um, Robin, I'm just wondering again another uh, another story from uh, Gabba Wanamu. Um, uh, a little bit about risks. Can you sort of tell the story about uh, sitting at the airport at Gabba Wanamu? <laughs> oh, right. Okay. So the COVID one was one uh, one story, and I think that photo there is us actually jumping back on the plane to go back to Darwin. But, um, you know, when, you, when you're when you traveling, and, and a lot of you probably know this already, is, um, you know, sometimes there's heaps of stuff happening in community life. And so one of the risks is um, making sure that there's somebody to pick you up out there. And so the last trip we went out, we was, nobody was there to meet us at Gubblewatamu. And so um, John walked up to the community, which was about an hour's walk up and I sat on the on at the airstrip here and the the, the pilot um eventually flew up a, again and just let you know tried to fly down low to to let them know that nobody had picked us up. But they're the kind of things you don't plan for. They're the things that you just gotta take it as it comes and you you don't panic, you don't get you know, I've learned not to get anxious now and just take it in my stride. The other thing was, um, uh, that was one I issue. And the other thing with planes was they forgot to pick us up. So we were left <laughs> at um, a community um, and we had to stay there the, uh, for another night, which kind of worked out fine because we got some more interviews and yarns done with um, some young young fellas there. Um, but it was like, oh, we didn't book you for a return flight. So we stayed at, um, I think it was Manmoy. Manmoy? Mm. Yeah, um, for the night. So that's, you know, um, those things that you take into consideration. That's what I'm talking about that planning loosely, going with the flow, gauging, putting your feelers out, knowing when to move forward, knowing when to stand back and distance yourself and, and that, and uh, learning, being a continual learner all the time and from that experience that prepares you for the next next um you know uh, visit or the the next chapter or season in in um indigenous research so very exciting times exciting <laughs> times yes and i mean i guess the, the point of this is just to say that there are risks with this kind of work um it's not uh sometimes it's the the things that you don't even think about like the the plane doesn't pick you up or there's no one to pick you up from the airport or as a, as I experienced uh, in Manangrida, um, you know, a dog attacking you and and sending you to the hospital. Um, you know, I had no idea that that could possibly happen to me. You know, um, and uh, you know there there are these 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 things that you just don't think about uh, when you're doing this kind of work as a particularly as an outsider, um, and um, 
you you have to be mindful of of all of that. Um, I do want to leave some time for questions, so I'm just going to. I think, um, Alison, I think you've been uh, sort of monitoring the chat. If there are any questions that uh, people might want to ask, then um, uh, either of us or Conrad and Dean. Lovely. I got, I got cut off. I got cut we off. I'm back on again. Oh, good. Oops. Welcome back. <laughs> Welcome back. You're the mug. We so, have. Thank you. Yes, you go ahead, Alison. Sorry, Christabel. Yeah, mm -hmm. we do have um, a comment and a question from Akshi. So the comment is, uh, it's interesting work and an initiative to make sure our work is relevant, efficient and effective, especially the community lead, community based approach. And the question is, I'm curious about the journey of the community engagement process. Was it challenging to involve people in the first place? If it was, what strategies were employed to foster meaningful community engagement in the research evaluation initiative? Robin, do you want to comment? Yeah, this is probably a question for Conrad and Dean, but mm. I, I, I don't think, I think when I think I think the beauty of this and the value of this, we've been talking about value, is that the very fact that we took a step back, John and I, and was able to lead, uh, uh, our, um, create the space for our local community-based and bidding researchers to take the lead on this, um, that's a win, you know, that, that that's like a no-brainer because like Dean said at the beginning, it's binning people talking to binning people. They have the relationships, they have the connections, they have the knowledge. Um, it to me, people were very engaging. Um, I can, you know, speak for uh, the Daruk, the woman who who I work with. Um, there was such a great effort that went out, and we went to people's places and sitting around the campfire and things like that, there was no hesitation. And you know why? Because education is very important to the people on the homelands because of the hardship they've been through, because of the fight, over 20 years fight, um, this was something that was close to their heart. And so um, from me as an outsider, um, coming in and looking in, I didn't see that as an issue, people wanted to talk, they wanted to engage, they wanted to give their stories. But with with this way of working, it was actually talking to um, their own family, relatives, um, um, bidding people. And so I think from the start, if you can start like that and work from a strength-based approach, so not external people coming in and saying, this is how you do it. This is the right way to go. No, no, we work from what we have there, the strengths and the knowledge base that we have on the ground. And I think that that set the tone for the whole evaluation. So I didn't see it as a big, big issue because it was binning people working with binning people. I mean, for, you know, for my perspective, uh, being as a researcher is, uh, I've learned a lot uh, communicating both sides, non-Indigenous people and our own people, just to getting a message across and identifying the best practices, best way to communicate with our people. Um, being a researcher or doing a research as well, not just on any in a growth area, we're seeing, what, what I'm being seeing that research, you gotta you got, you got start thinking of moving that research where people are in homelands. In this way, you get a better understanding how people live, what, 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 what they do uh, every day in their life how children are being educated. Or you stay at school for our children to continue education process in five days of education. So in my 
my understanding, the best practices, being a researcher, there's a two things that we need to understand. It's a people. Um, why you want to lead? Do you want to have that? Well, in the community, talking to the people uh, in the community and getting uh, information or taking those information outside of the community, out in a, you know, out in the homelands. Many, many times research network has been done in the community base, especially in you know, larger communities, growth areas. Nothing is ever done out in the homelands. So what happened now that we're seeing that this task as a research and being a researcher because there's more information you get out in the bush than in the growth areas. Mm. People need that education, especially homelands. One of the things that I was really, really impressed is elder people asked me, can you help me to bring education school for our children in the future? Well, that was my my work to follow up and to chase it. And I did a lot of hard bargaining and getting education processes happening in our community. Hey, Dean, there's a, there's a question in the chat window, which I think you're answering, actually, without even having a look at it. Uh, you, you, the question is uh, a great example of engagement being done the right way, supporting local ownership and control. Um, well, hang on, sorry. No, that was a, that was a comment. Um, can you share a bit of, more about how you share the findings of the evaluation with people who are part of the interviews? And I think you've just answered that question uh, from Melanie, uh, that you see it as your job to do that. You're the one that's actually doing the the sharing back into the community. Uh, am I right, Dean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, for my people to see me as a being a researcher, they're quite happy because I can talk in language. Hmm. I can relate to their understanding as well for education process. So there's no, you know, we don't see or people don't see that problem because they know we have been to been talking to each other about what we want to see the education for the future of our children. So that's how that when we do research with our own people, we don't necessarily see a bad things. And it's a good thing because we're getting that voice directly. But also we have a voice, um, um, cultural abortiveness. We know uh, that cultural affiliation, that, you know, we talk to the right people. We know there's, uh, you know, rules that we need to talk to the right people mm. in education. Sometimes we leave a room for our ladies to work with the ladies and there's a room for a binning a room spice so both sides you know um are not being seen as a bad idea this is a really good idea because the protocols is there that we always follow our rules who uh, who we talked with um, Dean and Conrad, I'd love to uh, have a follow-up uh, question here. We've got a question from Emily around balancing the Western and Indigenous ways. And I, I noted that came through in the report as well around balancing the the, the two worlds or the vintage and Balanda ways. Um, I would really love um, your thoughts on how to bring those two worlds together. We have to stand on our two feet and feed that information to cross, cross borders. I mean, it's <laughs> you know, being a, you know, being a, being a researcher, you know, both sides, you know, uh, able to understand how what what 
what I, what I'm delivering, you know, yeah. and um, making sure that families who I'm uh, talking to has an has an answer to to give us, and so it can be documented and put it in in the book because they also worried about this pro education for for a long long time. They want to get their facts straight by talking to us. This is what we want. So I don't see um, any problems with, you know, uh, or, 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 or people don't see any problems talking to them and getting that information because they want to deliver that information to us so it can be recorded. Conrad, are you able to talk? Or I think you're... you're... You're muted, but you're not muted. We can't hear you. Oh, I think we've lost the lost the audio link there. <laughs> yeah. Oh shame. Um but I think I mean I guess from my perspective, um uh Conrad, people like Conrad and Dean are very comfortable and, and competent, sort of working in those both ways, more than I am. Um and uh uh, you know, having those those, those sets of skills um, that I don't have is is just fantastic. It's gold, um, very very valuable. Hmm. I still can't hear Conrad though. Can't can't hear you, Conrad. No, still can't hear. And for like like being a like for us we we carry two two worlds. One world is hello. Oh, you're back, Conrad. <laughs> oh, it, it's my earphones. That's where the mood was. All right. Active. Anyway, I I was gonna say two things. Yeah. You know, the very first questions that was raised before this questions and the comment was. You know, there's first one acknowledgement. Acknowledgement is everything that we do in our culture and in, in our beliefs that where you know other countrymen share their knowledge by by immigration, bring that knowledge in marriage, and second of all, you know, having this two way education is something. You know, sometimes I get inspired myself. <laughs> you, you know, I, I, you know, it, it, it's like when I've learned English, it, it was really hard for, for me to learn it. But I have to learn my language first, how to read and write, because I had that access when I was reading by my own language and pronouncing my own language. That was so easy. So I've learned my language bilingual language studies. And as soon as I went English, it took me two years to learn English very quick and fast. And and when I got English and couldn't learn Kunwingo and English same time, and when I got it, got that both together, it made sense. And you know, I now I see what in terms of what I'm asking if in, in my language, and then when I want to interpret what it means, some Gunwingo doesn't really fit with English, but the one one Gunwingo, one word of Gunwingo might say different other things. Hmm. In English, it's very simple and it's easy. There's whole all heaps of things that doesn't really fit in with Gunwingo, but they do have that same sense of explain explanation. And yeah. Thanks, Conrad. I think we're just about out of time. Um, we are. Uh, any closing comments before we wrap it up? I, don't know, I just want to acknowledge, uh, uh, particularly Dean. Dean is about yeah. to become uh, acknowledged as a, as a doctor through um, Charles Darwin University. Uh, so I think we can give him a, a round of applause. Um, oh. For for that achievement, um, it's um, it's it's just I mean you you 
you both of you have always been professors as long as I've known you. But um, uh, it, I think it's just a, a great acknowledgement from uh, CDU that uh, uh, you, you will be acknowledged with a doctorate. Um, I think next month, is it, Dean? Yeah, next month. Yeah. 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 Oh. Well done. Done. Well I, was done. Really, really, I was really proud. Um, took me a long time, but, you know, at least, you know, I've got what I've wanted. Yes. And, uh, and continuance. Work uh, very important. Um, Fantastic. Uh, yeah. Look, on behalf of everybody on this call today, I would just like to say um, thank you to all of our presenters today, John, Robin, Dean and Conrad. Um, Olga, thank you for your contributions as well. Um, it's been fantastic um, to hear um, from your yourselves about uh, the, the journey that you've been on. Uh, and uh, there's lots of messages <laughs> coming up in the chat. Um, your, your, your presentation today has been really appreciated. So thank you very much for making the time today. Really appreciate it.